I'm so happy to have Keith Sini here with me today in studio. For those of you that are listening on the podcast, if you want to go to YouTube, you can get a look and, and see Keith in the flesh. Keith, how are you feeling today? Feeling great. It's a, another beautiful day here in Florida. It really is, right? This is our time of the year where we enjoy beautiful, cool weather and all those months that we were sweating it out in the summer, we, we um, reap the benefits. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice break. You know, I grew up in Michigan, so I'm used to the snow and uh, changing colors, but you know, I'm not going to complain about 80 degrees weather and and uh, hanging out at the beach. Yeah, good point. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. And um, you're a local acupuncture physician, am I right? Yes. Great. Yeah. And you have a business in Tequesta called Agape Healing Arts. Agape Healing Arts. And I practice together with my wife, Dr. Bella Lauren. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I have an agenda. I would like to ask you questions about acupuncture and about Chinese medicine just for to learn and try to understand a little bit more. I love getting acupuncture, um, but I maybe feel like the theory side is just so complicated. So I'm hoping we could create a conversation that for all of our listeners, we'll be able to um, maybe understand what's actually happening or maybe what your strategies are. But before we go there, I would like to, would you mind giving me a little synopsis of some of the modalities you've studied over the years and I'm, I'm guessing you've taken a lot. I know you've taken a lot of workshops and classes and a lot of different healing modalities. So maybe we could touch upon the ones that you feel like you utilize in your healing practices. Most, yeah, sure. The most, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the no brainer is, you know, I'm licensed as a licensed acupuncturist here in Florida. Uh, acupuncture is part of Chinese medicine. You know, Chinese medicine is, is an umbrella. Uh, which includes um, tuina, which is Chinese massage therapy, uh, herbs, exercise, even meditation. Uh, so the, the focus of my work is, is around that. Uh, Florida is great because we have a broad scope of practice here, and we can practice whatever we're trained and qualified in. So um, I got introduced really into the healing arts through Qi Nei Tsang, uh, which is basically organ massage therapy. Um, I was introduced to that from one of my Kung Fu teachers. When I asked him, I said, I'll really, Rene Navarro, uh, an 80 year old Filipino gentleman now. And I said, I'd really like to learn some more Kung Fu from you. And he goes, okay, come with me this weekend. And I was uh, living in New York City. And we went up to Boston for the weekend and he was teaching a workshop on this abdominal organ massage therapy. And mm. it really kind of like blew my mind. And changed my life. You had, had you had massage therapy prior to that? No, I, I probably didn't even get a massage until I was in my 30s. Yeah. After moving, I moved to New York City when I was 28. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Michigan. I, I was born in Detroit. Oh, wow. I yeah. had a, a practice in Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, for a year uh, before I moved down to Florida. In? In Ann Arbor. What, what type of practice doing? I was doing acupuncture. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah thought... I was fresh out of acupuncture school, uh -huh. and my mom got sick, and I ended up staying in Michigan to take my uh, national exams yep. and ended up opening a practice in Ann Arbor to sustain myself. Nice. And uh, before my partner at the time uh, desired to move to Florida, so I came down here in 2008. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, so the 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 chi ni tsang, the organ massage therapy, just was a very prof had a very profound impact on my on my life. Yeah, and that started to push me into going more into the healing arts uh, direction. I wasn't a practitioner at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just a, a martial artist, and I, my my passion was was martial arts. I had a business in New York City. And, uh, but after, as soon as I got out of work, we were going to the dojo or yeah, some yep. studio to train <clears throat> and uh, it, it evolved, you know, from the martial arts to yoga, to meditation. And then eventually I, I put, the, I took the leap and went to acupuncture school. Nice. How long did that take you? It took me three years. So it was a four year program. I was 38 when I went back to school. I wanted to get done and, and get out into the workforce, um, because of my background in martial arts, I knew I had a lot of 
knowledge about the philosophy of Chinese medicine and, and, you know, the acupressure points. And so I kind of knew a lot already going into school where a lot of students were just, some of them didn't even have a acupuncture treatment before. Gotcha. So I was going on with the, you know, some background and experience. Yeah. I left New York city, um, <laughs> after nine 11 uh-huh. and after the blackout. So there's a long, big story to a, you know, the, the journey. I'd like to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'd been, moved to New York city in 1994. I was 28 years old. You know, so my Saturn return. So I was starting really new there. So you'd already become an acupuncture physician in Ann Arbor. No, 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 no. This is before this is I was 28. Before. This I'm is sorry. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to build the timeline. Yeah. Yeah. All I right. lived well. I, you know, I said, I, I, after college, I went to Hillsdale college mm-hmm. and played football. Ah. And was on a national championship football team. Wow. And I was an all-American football player in Division II. Wow. Um, Any injuries? <laughs> the joke is I didn't really get hurt except for my three concussions. All so, right. <laughs> which is going to lead to another story about training at uh, Cranial Sacral Therapy at the John Up- Upledger Very Institute cool. right here right. in Palm Beach Gardens. Right. Nice. Yeah. So I, yeah, I grew up as an athlete. Uh, wrestled, football, track. Um, and since we're there, uh-huh. I'm going to mention I had my mentor who was a neighbor I met when I was about 14 years old. His name was Gordon Spaulding, and he was the first judo black belt in the state of Michigan. Mm. He was uh, an old Marine. He was a survivor of Pearl Harbor and Iwo Jima. Wow. And he was a competitive swimmer. He used to swim against Johnny Westmuller, who was the old Tarzan. Wow. And uh, when he got out of the Marines, and he would tell me the story about, you know, what it was like in, uh, in Hawaii. I'm trying, I can't remember the, the camp that he was there, but teaching the guys how to swim and looking at the soldiers putting up the flag in Iwo Jima, you know, which is memorialized in the statue in Washington, D.C. And so he was a, quite a character, and he was, um, he was Henry Ford's bodyguard, Henry Ford, wow. Henry Ford II, wow. and Lee Iacocca's personal bodyguard. So Whoa. he was the one, you know, these journeys, you end up meeting people and you have yeah. no idea. Yeah. And he, he, he was the one that kind of, like, opened my mind uh, I came from a simple family. My dad was a blue collar worker, worked at Ford Motor Company in four, Detroit. In Detroit yeah. for 42 years. Wow, wow. And uh, my mom was a stay at home mom. I grew up in a small town, Brooklyn, Michigan. Yeah. And uh, and that was the, the you know, that was that was the beginning of my my evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, then I went to Hillsdale College. I got a scholarship there. And I said played on that national championship team. <laughs> uh, my <sighs> sophomore year, my junior year, I actually left Hillsdale College and I went to Michigan State. Mm. And my roommate was Michigan State's Taekwondo coach. Uh-huh. His name was Lee Shin. Uh-huh. He went on and he was a uh, a judge for the Olympics in Australia in Taekwondo. And then I was like, wow, you know, like my the, when I came back to Hillsdale, the way I played totally changed. Ah, uh. you know, through. This, these explosive movements I was learning through the martial arts. Yeah. But my focus was on athletics. Yeah. And uh, anyway, graduated from school, <laughs> worked at a men's clothing store, uh, moved to L.A., ah. came back to Michigan, and um, eventually moved to New York City uh, to start a business with my, my friend there, yeah. Bill Kalush, who wrote a book on Houdini. Because my roommate in New York City was David Blaine, and uh, I don't know any connections between Houdini and David Blaine. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm out of that loop. Well, David Blaine, you know, he was the magician. I know the name. Yeah, okay, right? yeah, he yeah. Buried yeah. himself That's alive right. for That's seven right. days. I was yeah. one of the guys who who lowered him down. Oh wow! And that was my first discovery of fasting. It was the first time I did a master cleanse. We all did a master cleanse. Ah. To, yeah. Kind of support him. Isn't that the one with uh, the, like uh, lemon juice and cayenne pepper? Maple syrup. Maple syrup. Yeah. All right. Yep. 10 yep. days. Uh-huh. I'm like, wow, you know, felt great. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so 
I was in a, it was a very interesting circle in New York City. So, you know, New York City, I, I was a, a bouncer. Um, I worked at clubs. I did personal security for Madonna and Prince. Ah. I had a whole other, like... I didn't know any of this about you, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all funny, funny stories. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, and then you are... So, you're in New York City. Yeah. And, and you, at this point, are an acupuncture No, no, Not no. Yet. So I we haven't a, gotten I'm acupuncture school yet. I'm a produce broker selling onions and potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I had been uh, working at the clubs, and I was leading a pretty hedonistic lifestyle. You know, uh-huh. partying uh-huh. all night long, hanging yeah. out with yeah. made guys and hell's yeah. angels and going to after hours clubs. And there was a, uh, a, a what year are we talking about? And you said 92, 93, 94. Yeah. Well, I moved to New York city in, uh, in 1994. So yeah. 1994, yeah. 95, 96. And, uh, there was an incident where I realized like, you know, what am I going to do? I can't, this isn't the lifestyle that I want to lead. Yeah. And I, you know, my, my, my stories, oh, I was an all American football player. You know, who am I now? You know, what am I doing? Yeah. If I go this direction, which I can go, you know, I'm being invited in to and drawn into, or do I choose a different path for myself? Understood. Yeah. And so, um, within the, a few weeks, I just walked away from my job one night and I said, I'm done with this. I was still lifting weights. I was big, but the city was incredibly stressful. I started losing my hair, breaking out my skin, grinding my teeth at night. Um, yes. It was uh, real challenging. And I knew I had to make a change because yep. I was going to crash and hit a wall. <laughs> yeah. And I asked one of my buddies, I said, I want to train martial arts and I want to do something with no punching and no kicking. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, come with me to the New York Aikikai. The Aik- and it was an Aikido school, okay. preeminent Aikido school in the whole country. And I went there with him like the next day and I got hooked. Yeah. I joined. Yeah. I started training every day at Aikido. And it was, which was, it's the Steven Seagal uh, martial art. You know, when you think about it, even though Steven Seagal <laughs> isn't a very good model for Aikido, but it's a wonderful uh, martial art. And uh, it means the way of peace and harmony. Mm. And it was the founder was Osensei. And my teacher, Yamada Sensei, who just passed away within a year, he was the head of the North American and South American Aikido Federation. Wow. And so all the big mucky muck Aikido masters would come to New York City and teach. Yes. And then uh, one day they... Um, Yamada Sensei was going back to Japan to Humbu Dojo, and it was the first time he was going to teach in Japan. Mm. And I went on that trip to Japan to train Aikido in, uh, in its homeland. And uh, it was amazing. I bet. It was, yeah, uh, transformative. It embedded me into that Aikido community. But then I started, I wanted to do a martial art with no where I, Aikido, you need somebody to practice against. Yeah. And I wanted to do something where I could practice on my own. And I started looking for Tai Chi. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to Chinatown and going to different schools. And uh, I found a Tai Chi teacher that I liked. And I released and let go of Aikido mm-hmm. and starting doing Tai Chi. Yeah. Which is where I met Renee Navarro. Uh-huh. And R- Renee was a... Uh, a renaissance man. He was a Filipino who had been, I don't know, like excommunicated from the Philippines because he spoke against Marcos. Ah. And he was an attorney and a poet and a father and an acupuncturist. Ah. Yeah. This is your entry into the world of Chinese medicine? Of Chinese uh, medicine. Uh, specific, yeah. Specifically. Specifically, yeah. 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 And, uh, and he opened my brain you know like wow you can be all these things yeah and he did it later in life too you know he uh-huh. wasn't a uh-huh. spring chicken he was a you know 20 he was a 20 years older than me he was a grandfather and a lot yeah. of wisdom you know one yeah. of those yeah wise old yes um masters yes masters you know he was a 
one of Montak Chia's senior practitioners oh my gosh. in Chiang Mai. Interesting. Yeah. And so then he introduced me to Taoist alchemy and Chinese philosophy. And I was a, as I was training in Tai Chi, I was like, wow, the only way I can like go to the next level is to learn these principles of acupuncture. And then, so then I started to want to go yes. to acupuncture school. Yes. Uh, but the, you know, <clears throat> the pieces weren't in place yet. You know, I was visiting all the acupuncture schools. I started practicing more Qigong. So Tai Chi is a form of Qigong, uh, but Tai Chi is a, a martial art and mm -hmm. Qigong are basically Chinese health exercises. Yeah, I call it Taoist inner alchemy, how to transform negative emotions and the positive attributes. We can talk more about that yes. when we start talking about yes. the, the Chinese medicine. And so I was going to a little Japanese lady in the Lower East Side, you know, and, and training Qigong with her. Um, at some point along the path, then 9-11 happened, uh, which was... You know, you know, obviously, like an, an incredible pivot point. Yeah. You know, in, in my history. life and yeah. in history. Yeah. 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 In many other people's lives, and I attribute the qigong practice. Like, I, how, why did I start practicing qigong before this event happened? Mm. Mm. And I never really registered that I had PTSD from that event. Um, uh, I was hang one of my the, I was hanging out with my friend who was a Navy SEAL, you know, waiting for his girlfriend to come out of downtown because all the subways were shut down, the uh, planes, uh, the fighter jet planes are flying overhead. It's just we sat down and had a bar and just watched them, watched the madness unfold wow. while we were waiting for his his wow. uh, his girlfriend at the time to show up, and I was hanging out with my other friend. Angel, who grew up on army barracks, he was a Puerto Rican guy, and uh, who, who grew up in the army, and just crying his heart out because yeah. he was downtown. I, you know, it might be vivid, but I guess it's just part of the story. Is you know, he was watching the people jump out of the buildings. Yeah, and he came home, and he was one of the toughest yes. guys I know, yeah. and just you yeah, know, just devastated. So it was a very Gosh, that's a whole other. There's a whole. I hear you. Other story that. Well, I appreciate you going there, though. I want. I like these details. So it was impact. It was the, that's what yeah. said. That was the you know. I can't keep yeah. doing yeah. the things that I'm doing. Yes. And I was even though I was making a lot of money and having a lot of fun and and still doing the things I I love to do through the martial arts, I still wasn't happy. No. And I had a tendency to blame that unhappiness uh, on my circle, on my yeah. business partner in yeah. particular. Yeah. And I said, I can't keep blaming him for my unhappiness. I have to take responsibility to find out what makes me happy and, and move along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so then I started, I went, I did my yoga teacher training. With who? With uh, Katul. Katul was uh, one of... This uh, is in New York City still. This is yeah. in New York City. Yeah. He had a Rasa Yoga Studio. How, on how the, do I spell Katul? K or C? With a K, K-E-T-U-L. K cool. I think he still teaches in Colorado. He was the director of the Kripalu Institute. Ah, um, I thought I heard that name before. Like, okay. And I f who was the guy in Gainesville, um, the old um, Indian? Amrit Desai. Amrit Desai, yeah. yeah. Who you now know. has a place here in Florida. He has a place here mm -hmm. in Florida. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a falling out with Kripalu. Yes. I actually went and trained with him down the road because I, I still love his yoga nidra, phenomenal yeah. yoga nidra yeah. teacher and very, you know, that the, the spiritual world, whether it's yoga or meditation is full of trappings. And there's, I have a gazillion oh. stories and I know you yeah. probably have a few yeah. stories too yeah. around, you know, how do you traverse that path? And uh, so I started doing yoga and, uh, Trained with Patabi Joyce after 9-11. The Iyengar Yoga Institute was in New York City. My first yoga class was at Shivananda, which was the oldest yoga studio in New York City. And, you know, was started doing yoga. Started getting involved in, uh, in meditation and getting involved with Tibetan Buddhism with the Shambhala Center. And, you know, I took uh, the MBSR you know, the mindfulness-based stress 
reduction training yes. program yes. at, at uh, Barnard College. All right. I got to tell you just a funny story tell about me, that. Tell me, please. Yeah. Because when I called who, to sign who's up. The, uh, who's the guy that leads that? I know his name. It's a really well-known uh, John author. John Cabot-Zen. Thank you. Yeah, John Cabot-Zen. Yeah. Yeah, it was a great program because I was looking, how do I put like tools in my toolbox to go out in my life to figure out this, what's this next piece yes. you know, going to be? Yes. And at this um, point, are you generating any income from your passion with martial arts, I'm selling, I'm yoga. selling onions and potatoes. You're, you're still in the onion I'm potato selling, gig. Yeah, it was a very good business. It was a very lucrative business. And we were selling to, to, nice. to the, to, you know, buy the truckloads, you know, 40,000 uh -huh. pounds at a time. And but at this point, do you have a little bit of a vision of, uh, you know, like now you I, have a business. Yeah. Uh, I, you're working I wanted with to your open healing. up a Tai Chi and yoga studio. That's what your thought was. Yeah. All right. I wanted to open yeah. up a Tai Chi and yoga studio. Um, and so I started arming myself. Yes. I never got any black belts. I never got any certifications. I just like to, I wanted to train. I was just yeah. interested in yeah. training and getting on the mat, getting yeah. on the floor. I do want to hear your funny story though about yeah. the MBSR. I, yeah. took, I took you off the track. No, that's okay. I, because I, I, I called up Barnard College <laughs> and we're like, do you, do you care if it's all women or all you know girls in the class? I'm like, no, I don't got a problem with that. And um, I showed up for the first class. And one of the young ladies was upset that there was a man in the class. And I'm like, well, I don't understand why. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. And then I found Barnard College is an all-women's college. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, that was that. That is pretty classic, it was yeah. Funny. It was well, classic. Why did they just, let you in then? Yeah, why, they let why, me in. They asked her to leave because she was uncomfortable. And they said I could stay. All right. And, uh, All right. Yeah, so that was, yeah. 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 That was that. And, and so, yeah, I was, you know, I... I started exploring. I wanted to get uh, Tai Chi certifications. I got my Qigong certifications. I got my meditation certifications. This was with what? This was with MBSR, the certification uh, yeah. meditation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, I did a lot of, you know, Taoist meditation, and I was going to Shambhala all the time, and yeah, there was just. I was just immersed in that yes. world now. Yes. You know, New York City just has, it has all the worst things that you can imagine, right? Because that <laughs> yeah. was yeah. kind of the shadow life, uh -huh. you uh -huh. know? I said I went to New York City uh -huh. to become intimate friends uh -huh. with my shadow. Yeah. Now it's not scary anymore. Yeah. And, um, and it has all the, you know, I got to train with the Dalai Lama for seven days and Thich yeah. Nhat Hanh and Oh, wow. You know, I'd go to the um, Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, and there was always, you know, wonderful programs there. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we used to have uh, Srivatsa Ramaswamy uh, come to our house because his son lived in Jersey City. So after, just before 9-11, I bought a condo in Jersey City, and Srivatsa Ramaswamy was one of Krishna Ma, Krishna Macharya's senior students after Patabe Joyce, yes. Iyengar, <coughs> yes. and uh, his son, Desikachar. So I trained with all these guys. I was yeah. young and Really good time, teachers. And yeah. It was, yeah. It was a ph phenomenal time. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. So then, yeah, so I collected all these tools. Um, that was from 2001 to 2003. <laughs> Those two years, I was like, whoosh, pushed, gathered it all in. I had a falling out with my business partner. I walked away from that business, and I opened up the Heaven and Earth Center on Sixth Avenue. And uh, wow, you opened up a location in New York City New York on City. Sixth Avenue. On Isn't Sixth, Sixth Avenue. down near Soho? Isn't that kind of no? It's is that near Broom Street? It's or? actually it was right across the street from the New York City Public Library. All right. And, I uh, do know that area. Yeah, okay, Sixth uh -huh. Avenue and Thirty Ninth uh -huh. Street. Got it. Yeah. Wow. So you opened up. A, what what size space did you open? It How was, many square feet? Uh, it, it was about the space. I can't re probably. You know, I remember the square footage being about yeah. twelve hundred square feet. Yeah. yeah. And Affordable at that time. I, okay. I can't. I can't <laughs> it imagine. It was in comparison to nowadays. In comparison to now. But at yeah, that time, so, still, yeah. still seeming like, whoa, this is a big plunge. I'm thinking. Yeah, it was a big plunge. Like I guess I had. Socked some money away, yeah, 
And unfortunately, the school like sucked it all up very quickly. Yes. I didn't really have a marketing yes. plan. Yes. It was just, this is what I wanted to do, and I'm going to do it. I was like uh, too ignorant to even know any better. What a great story, because how many of us are in that situation at some point or another when we try to follow our passion or dream, and then the reality of the business side yeah, of it is just a whole I, other. I actually, I put a second mortgage on my house which is they tell you not to do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't That's do that. not a good business plan. Not a good business plan. Yeah. And I did. And it came to an, I, it came to a point where like, you know, this isn't going to work. It was a weird concept because I was doing Tai Chi and yoga and meditation. They would had a ray. I was do, they would do raves in my yoga studio at night to try mm -hmm. to get income mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. but it connected me with Alex Gray him and his wife and his daughter came in and we used to have I used to have art exhibits in the yoga studio. That's cool. And his um, work is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before he has his cot, we were going to his house in Brooklyn, you know, to do full moon ceremonies with Himalayan voices were which was a couple guys that came in to New York and they had the gongs and they taught me all about sound healing. Wow, because they were doing the they were doing the full moon ceremonies at Alex Gray's, and then they'd come to my place and nice. have like a place that they could do their sound healing and their practices, and they'd actually watch the studio for me when I was gone, and it was a great uh, relationship. I met my Tibetan teacher um, there. Um, another story. But they were looking for a place to hold their sangha, yeah. you know, their, yeah. and they, I said, yeah, yeah please, yeah. You know, come on in. And, yes. And uh, so I met my, my teacher, Tibetan teacher there. And, and then I realized, you know, through that challenge is like, I did not want to teach Tai Chi to make a living. I did not want to teach Tai Chi and, and yoga to try to make a living. <laughs> not easy. Right. And it's you challenging. Know? Yeah. It's challenging. It's challenging. Yeah. And yeah. it's so so then I made the decision to leave. It was finally time to leave yeah. after 10 years. We went yeah. through the, the blackout, which was another, you know, kind of crazy story. And I always knew I wasn't going to stay in New York City. Uh, but I didn't. I said, well, when something happens here, I'll leave. And then 9-11 happened, and I didn't leave. I stayed because right? there was things to do. Yeah, yeah, And I yeah. did the things that I needed to do. And I said, you know what? Um, I want to go to acupuncture school. Nice. I knew I couldn't pull it off in New York City because there's just too many distractions, even though there were some great uh, schools there. And my partner at the time was going to grad school in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Santa Fe is somewhere I always wanted to live. Um, I drove through New Mexico one time on my way from Detroit to L.A., <laughs> And it was beautiful. The The mountains looked like oh, it was so beautiful. paintbrushes. I'm like, oh, this is like the paint. This is like. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I went to Santa Fe, packed up my, sold my condo. And that's where you went to acupuncture and school? And I, I moved to Santa oh, Fe. Wow. And I went to acupuncture school in Santa Fe. That's kind of like, the, that's like one of the dreams. Like, I think if I was going to go to acupuncture school, that would almost be one of my dream locations to go just because you associate Santa Fe with a lot of the arts that you're speaking of. Master so I'd, healers. I would imagine the, it'd be an the, incredible the, place to hang yeah, out and learn from. Yeah, it was great. Um, man, it was hot springs and I was friends with uh, Robert Mirabal, who's a very well-known Taos, Taos uh, native flute artist. And we'd go to Hot Springs, and I made some amazing local friends. And I got introduced to the Native American church and had my first peyote ceremony out wow. there. Wow. And yeah, just met phenomenal teachers and mentors, and uh, it was, a, it was a, a great experience. Oh, man, that sounds amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so three years there? Two, you two years in Santa Fe. Two years? Grad, yeah, not yet graduated then from no, acupuncture not, school. No. So what had happened is my 
partner wanted to go to the Ayurvedic Institute to study with Dr. Vasant Ladd in Albuquerque. I've heard of him. He's one of the premier, he is the premier yeah, person yeah. in America to go study yeah, so Ayurvedic. If you go to India, if you go to Kerala and you tell them, I want to study Ayurveda, they'll say, why don't you go study with Dr. Vasant Ladd? They'll Ladd send in the you back States. to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so then I moved to Albuquerque to do my last year. Isn't there also a really amazing Hanuman temple there? The Hanuman temple's in Taos. It is Taos. It's right. Taos. All yeah, right. that's All right. right. I heard about that too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many spiritual centers and, you know, I don't, you know, it's kind of very new age. It's the second largest artist market in the country. They have uh, like native the, the people fly from all over the world there to purchase art from the, the Native Americans and the yes. different artists there. Yes. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Nice. Magical place. Nice. Mountains, rivers. How did you come, How did you do two years there? And you said you went to... So, so I went, to, it was SWAC, Southwest Acupuncture College. So oh. they had campuses in Santa Fe, oh, Albuquerque, nice and Boulder, Colorado. Got it. So it was an easy move. Yeah. And then while I was going to acupuncture school, I used to get to go study with Dr. Vasant Lad on the weekends. Yeah. Yeah, and I taught Tai Chi at the Ayurvedic Institute, and that was another, you know, I got to learn about Ayurveda and uh, another wonderful opportunity. And just, you know, anybody who has an opportunity to study with Dr. Vasant Ladd. I'm trying to convince a couple people now, like, go <laughs> study with Vasant. Now Whoa. they moved to Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, I didn't know that. But he, you know, it's just, a, it's just you, you, you're immersed in, in, the, in the culture and the philosophy and the medicine. It's just, it was another wonderful wow. opportunity. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm a practitioner. <laughs> I graduated from school in 2007. Very cool. Uh, I, so I went to Michigan, opened up my practice in Ann Arbor. You know, my mom fell ill. She had a brain aneurysm on Thanksgiving Day and um, and survived at 80 years old. She was 80 years old. Wow. And so I went home to help take care of her. And she re re miraculously uh, recovered. Nice. And I had an opportunity to... And it wasn't an opportunity. My girlfriend said, if you want to be with me, you're going to have to move to Florida because I can't deal with the cold weather anymore. Uh -huh. And uh, I felt like I felt complete with what I needed to do in Michigan with my parents. Yeah. And I, I came to Florida uh, with no money, uh, no car, mm. no job, and no place to live. We didn't wow. know where we were going to live yes. in, uh, yes. in Florida. And we ended up here in Jupiter because a friend, Jyoti, who went to the Ayurvedic Institute, was working for Tiger Woods on privacy. Uh -huh. So we stayed with her while we canvassed the state looking for a place to live. And we'd go to Sarasota and we'd go to Naples and we were in South Beach and Fort Lauderdale. And we were right up about to sign a deal on a house in Fort Lauderdale and it fell through, and I said, I'm sick of looking for a place. I love Jupiter. Can we just stay in Jupiter? Yeah. <clears throat> and the next day, I found an apartment in Jupiter on the water. Nice. You know, before the, the Jupiter that's today, you know, was yeah. in 2008. Yes, yes. And I've been here ever since, and I, I just, I love it. I couldn't think yeah. that I would live anywhere else. I hear you, Keith. And it's become a hotbed <laughs> of healing as much so as New York City or Santa Fe. You know, there's so many ama amazing healers here. Um, when I got here, uh, I started working at the Hippocrates Health Institute. Yes. And I had a chance now to learn about raw living foods and wheatgrass juice therapy and, and hang out with Victoris Kolvinskis, you know, who was the grandfather of this raw food movement. Yes. And um, I was teaching... Um, Qigong and meditation there and practicing acupuncture. And lo and behold, what a perfect opportunity to practice this organ massage therapy. I'm like, wow, this just fits right into this work. Yes. You know, with the diet and the colonics. And, um, and, uh, and I went back and I started to formally 
study this Chinate song that originally sent me on the path. I don't even know how many years ago he he invited me up to Boston to to, to share that skill with me. And so then I was working at Hippocrates. I was still doing my Chine Tsang training every summer. I'd go away to Asheville and yes. train with different teachers. And uh, I would practice. I had an office at different places in the area So because that's in West Palm Beach and we're here in Jupiter. Spent seven years there, and at which my time was over. And then I started working I had been taking classes now, this, which leads me into the craniosacral therapy. So that's my, the bulk of my work is the acupuncture, the organ massage therapy, and craniosacral therapy. And of course, I was attracted to the craniosacral therapy because I suffered or I'd been diagnosed with at least three concussions. And yes. I know I have post-concussion <laughs> syndrome yeah. issues. Yeah. yeah, And I'm like, wow. I had no idea the Upledger Institute's literally 10 minutes from my house. Isn't that classic? Dr. John Upledger was an osteopath at Michigan State, which was where I used to go to football camp in the summertime when I lived in Michigan. And he had moved here in 1984, which is when I graduated from high school. And then I had a chance to, to train. Uh, I didn't necessarily train with him. I met with him because mm-hmm. he was older, mm-hmm. along in years by that mm-hmm. time. But... Um, you know, just embrace the whole craniosacral therapy program. So one of my focuses is on concussions and migraines and mild TBIs. Yes. And so that's the, 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 the you know, I have craniosacral therapy and, and organ massage therapy and the gut brain axis has always been like a passion. And so it, it just felt right you know, hand in hand, Yeah. you know, with acupuncture and Chinese medicine as, yes. as my base. Yes. And, um, that's incredible. That's an, that's a very wide array of practical experience that you just, that you just ran us through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I fit it all in. It's, like, it's really, you know, the, it's really, this is life as a dream. Yeah. You know, yeah. I came to Jupiter with you know living in Detroit and LA and New York City and going to school in Santa Fe and coming here with a partner who went back to New York City and then meeting my wife who was an acupuncturist and midwife and had four kids and um, we're celebrating um, our 10 year anniversary nice. this month congratulations in December and we're celebrating 10 years of agape healing, healing arts yes uh, this month congratulations yeah thank you so much because i know you work with your wife too yes <laughs> yeah i know when people when we first started doing that people said it'll either make or break us oh yeah you know they said you know Both. a lot of people are like you know i could not work with my wife or my husband because i'd kill him or they'd kill me yeah and uh but right away we clicked on it where it worked and we knew like it wasn't a, wasn't a trial you know of course everyone has challenges but yeah i i couldn't imagine doing what i do with out doing it with Tamara, my wife. I, I just I just wouldn't want to do what I do if I didn't have her as my partner. So uh, it's a real blessing and an amazing experience. So I'm so happy to when I meet other couples that are doing it as well and able to manage the marriage relationship and the business relationship and it actually works. Is it? It's well. Would you do you think it takes a lot of work or is it a natural process for you? I mean, like, I mean, a, a little bit of both, right? Well, I mean, no marriage I, I, or no. I will say I have the highest respect, <laughs> you know, for you, and I I, I bow down Thank at you, your Keith. feet because, you know, you make it work, you know, and we're in a field like where like, you know, every with everything going on in the world. And people, oh, I just wish for peace. But how can there be peace outside of ourselves if there's not peace within? Yes. How can there be peace between, you know, two opposing ideologies if there can't be peace in a marriage? Yeah. And ultimately, you know, that's all, all we're striving for is peace at the end of our lives. You know, that's all you want is peace. You don't want chaos and drama and, and turbulence. And I did not pick an easy partner, but, and you, they 
break you and, and make you, you know, yeah. it's like you have to yeah. get broken yeah. and then you, you put yourself back together. And that's yeah. how, well you know, said. when a, sh- a, a snake sheds its skin, it, it, it's cause it's growing. And so we're growing in, in those challenging times. Great point. You're right. You said there's, yeah. there's always going to be challenges and how do you engage them and, and dance with them and overcome them? Yeah. Cause it's easy to be a monk in the mountains. I, I could go, she's like, you've been a monk. I said, I know I've been a monk. <laughs> I, I know I've been a monk yeah. in, in my yeah. past life. Yeah. And I've done that. And, yeah. and now it's time for something different. My yeah. buddy laughed. He was like, you've done all that. Do this, yeah. you know, and I've. Who's that famous uh, meditation author that wrote the book after the, after the ecstasy, the laundry. <laughs> have, you, have you read that one? I haven't read that one. I'll have to come up with the author name and uh, give him credit for mentioning his book. But I love that title because like you can have an ecstasy experience uh, in a setting like uh, I'm just solo and hanging out. And but then when you come down back to the raising children, holding down the fort for business, being committed in a relationship, yeah. there's the laundry to do. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the other book, I, you know, uh, <laughs> Chop wood and carry water. All right. You know, you, yes. that's, you get up, yeah. you have a rough day, and you yeah. get up and you get the, it's a brand yeah. new day. Yeah. How do you want yeah. to start it? Yeah. yeah. And I, I couldn't have dreamed of my life being this good. And I met a partner that makes me want to be better. I trigger her. You know, she triggers me. You know, there's a whole you know, philosophy of relationship that, um, you know, we attract that partner in our lives that's either going to reinforce those triggers that were installed in us as young children or heal those triggers because you're going to be triggered. And so you're going to just reinforce those bad habits and unconscious, well said. you know, yep. patterns. Yep. Or are you going to respond instead of react you know how do you respond in a healthy way and yes. my kids taught me a lot about that yes because i you know admittedly i had a lot of anger issues i i grew up fighting i used to you know wrestling and football i, I it makes sense yeah you almost I, would I, need to have a little aggression to be good at yeah, wrestling and football you know, right and like if you're and so what had happened was the martial arts gave a form to my energy instead yeah, of being yeah chaotic yep. and fighting yeah. and drinking yep. and yep. all the bad habits, right? Yeah. Yep. It's like, oh, psh, it took that energy and, yep. and put a form to it. Yeah. So it wasn't just yeah. Yeah. out there. Yeah. And uh, so I have a lot of uh, compassion for my kids because they remind me of who I was at that age. I'm like, yeah. I just, now when my son yeah. triggers me, I yeah. just laugh. I go, yeah. <laughs> you, got, you remind me of me when I was your age, so I get it, <laughs> yes. you know? And, and I, when I oh, was, gosh. when they were little, like, and my anger would come up, I'm like, what am I, I'm going to yell at a little kid? I'm like, that's yeah. ridiculous. You know, yeah. you want to yeah. cuddle them and hold yeah. them and yeah. tell them they're safe and okay. Yeah. Maybe I didn't have that growing up. Yeah. Um, so it gives me, does kind of heal you. Don't you think a little, like when you then open up and give them a hug that it does kind of heal maybe that spot that didn't get one when you were a kid. Well, you know, one of the philosophies, you know, from like Ho'oponopono, uh, which is the Hawaiian prayer, which is, I love you. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Thank you. Which is a mantra, Mm. uh, for me and my practice. Um, one of the, they say, take self responsibility, you know, for your actions and every, anything that shows up in your life is a mirror of you, you know? So if I look at you, you know, closely into your eyes, all I see is a reflection of me, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know, you're giving your, your children a hug is, is giving yourself a hug yeah. at that age yeah, or an ear, you know, to listen to. Cause that like, you know, I realize like kids, all they want, they want love and they want to be heard. Yeah. And so, you know, that's challenging in, in modern lifestyle for, for people to just stop and, and listen to your kids, listen to their frustrations, listen to their problems. You don't, my daughter comes to me. I don't have answers, but I listen, you know, and then she feels heard, and then she doesn't yeah. have to carry it around yeah. you know, on her back. Great point. 
So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, relate, like I said, it's easy to be a monk in the mountains. Yeah. But then where is that reflection? Where are those triggers? And that's where, that's where you really get an opportunity to grow. And if you really want to put yourself in the fire, yeah, you know, work with your wife. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Add a and little more dynamic right? that's energy. The Phoenix, yeah. I like, I'm Phoenix rising out of the ashes <laughs> like every Friday. <laughs> Oh man, I hear you, Keith. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, I love. Uh, yeah, I always. I'm always looking at couples too. I know we have Michael Shea and Kathy yes, Shea, yes, yes. power couple. Yes, and those are my models now. Like, yeah, the re- yeah. And the, I, I have to say this because now we're in the Aquarian age. Okay, right. And so we're coming out of the age of Pisces for the last last twenty six hundred years, which is the the, the sign of the fish. And Aquarius is the two lightning bolts. It's the black and white lightning bolt. And so that's yin and yang in perfect harmony. So it's the the divine masculine and the sacred feminine. Now, there's not a patriarchy or matriarchy. There's not one stamping over the other. How do we Mm. move Mm. through the world in Mm. healthy relationship? Yeah. Because that's the only thing that's going to heal the planet. You know, whether it's black and white or gay or straight or Jewish, Muslim, you know, we got to find harmony and balance, which is, yes, yes. again, brings me back to, to Chinese medicine and the yes. whole philosophy is based off of yin and yang. Yeah. Not too much, yeah. not yeah. too little. Yeah. Try to find a healthy place yeah. in between. Yeah. You know, you don't got to run a marathon, but you can't lie on the couch all day. You yeah. know, how do you find yeah. that, that median? Yes. And so whether it's, you know the the myself you know the anima and animus and myself yeah in the masculine and feminine in relationship you know how do you interact with your students and our community and then you know out you know to the whole it's like throwing a rock into a pond and those ripples go out to the rest of the world and then it but it all you know yeah. all starts yeah. starts with me I don't know who's, there's somebody else who said it. Yeah. It has to start with you. Great. And I think well, yes. I feel great because I know you guys embody that. You know, when you come to native yoga, you, you feel that. Oh, thank you, Keith. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate that. I honor your path of, you know, with the path that you, you and, and uh, Tamara have been on is, is amazing because oh. you're partners your business owners, your parents. I appreciate hearing that because um, when you go through challenge, you sometimes forget to look at it from the angle of, of that, you know. So thank you so much for, for saying that. I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. If I had to then, because I have, we, we got a very good, I, I wanted to hear your story because I, we've, had, we've had a chance to take cranial sacral therapy training yeah. or biodynamic cranial sacral therapy training with Michael Shea when, we're, yeah. when he's here. We've had a chance to see each other in different environments, but I've never had a chance to really speak with you this long and hear your story. Yeah. So I'm glad that we took the time to lay that down. And then in the essence of trying <laughs> to stay somewhat on time yeah. with our conversation today, And the enormous subject of what I want to dive into, which is... I'm going to bring it... Help me understand. Help me understand. Like when I hear liver meridian, lung meridian, uh, gallbladder meridian, and how do I start to make sense of this in my practical life, in my daily life? Well, I'm going to... This is my... I call my four years of school into a four-minute program, which is... So there's about 365 acupuncture points on the body, like the 365 days of the year. Those points lie on meridians or energetic pathways, and which there are 12 major meridians, like the 12 months of the year. And you named some of them. Those meridians connect to our organs, which you named some, but we concentrate on five major organs, your liver, your heart, your spleen, your lungs and kidneys. And they say the five, so that's the corresponds with the five seasons or the five elements. And they all have responsibilities that we can talk about. And so the core of that is um, 
there's a yin and yang aspect to those organs. So we're so not too much, not too little. How do we bring those organs back into balance? And you, you, one aspect of yin and yang is chi, or vital life force energy, and blood, which is the, the, the matter, the material. And so the unifying force is chi. Chi is like the glue. Chi is the vital life force energy that runs through us and all living things. It runs through these organs. So you, the, the liver is a place that we tend to hold stress. So that can get bound up and stagnant or stuck or blocked. And that inhibits the chi from flowing into your spleen. So now you got all this welling of energy in the liver and you have a depletion in the spleen. And so just like a, a dam in a river, the water wells up on one side and dries up on the other side. And the acupuncture needle goes in there and pushes a log out of the way and allows that chi and blood to flow into that other area to Got create it. homeostasis in the body. Got it. So that's a 365 points, 12 meridians, five organs, balance yin and yang to help yes. move the chi. Got it. So that's. Chinese. That's what I tell my clients on the table when yeah, they ask me, yeah. "What's going on? What, what are, are we doing? doing? How, how? Yeah, yeah. explain so this to me." The, yeah. the, and the body knows how to heal itself. Its natural state is homeostasis. You're yes. healthy, but then you know we're our worst enemy. I said the toxic cocktail is stress and diet. You know, we all have stress. You know just eating and breathing, like try holding your breath. <laughs> How stressful yeah. that gets very yes. quickly, right? Yes. yes, So we have pranayama, you know, to help move the chi. And, and, and other, you know, stress management tools. You know, how do you deal with that and give you tools to deal with that? And then diet. Yeah. You know, how yeah. do you, do you, are you eating processed foods, fast foods? Or are you eating organic foods, you know, healthy foods? Yes. So those, those th that's kind of, you know, what I'm, I'm looking at yeah. when I see my clients. We were, we're talking about sense. we'll take a health history, and then we want to take what are your health goals and how do we achieve those? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so you, if you're dealing with acute disease or chronic disease, most of the stuff we see now is is chronic. Even though I have a background working with um, ath athletes and martial artists, because I came up as an athlete and martial artist. Yes, but I, I work with a lot of sick people at Hippocrates, even in school, you know, I was working with, a very, you know, I was working at an AIDS clinic and mm. different s situations, but most of the stuff we see now is chronic and how do you change, you know, is it because a hundred years ago when we, we died much earlier because of uh, uh, virus mm -hmm. and trauma, mm. oh, you got the, the black Spanish fly disease or I don't know what <laughs> yeah. that was right you know or yeah, you, yeah. you fell off a ladder and <laughs> yeah you know but now we got emergency rooms yeah and we got penicillin so like oh yeah. hey yeah pretty good yeah and so now it's mostly you know chronic chronic disease so that you know because you could do something at 20 or 30 all of a sudden 40 and 50 and I'm coming up on 60 pretty soon and mm -hmm. that was an mm -hmm. a lifetime of bad habits and so now your body can't get rid of the toxicity and the waste products yes. that you've accumulated over time mm -hmm. and uh, unless you've been taking care of yourself doing yoga and, mm -hmm. and watching what you eat and, and yeah. practicing yeah. meditation or having a prayer practice good point yeah good point so you know doctor um the the root word of doctor is really teacher you know, so how many doctors mm. in the medical community are teaching you how to maintain your health? And so that's really I, my role is to teach people how to heal themselves. Yes. Because I said, I don't have to tell the needles what to do when we, you know, insert them. The body knows what to do to heal itself. It's just get out of your own way and take a look. You don't need... You know, you don't need to cold turkey, you know, stop drinking alcohol or dairy or carbs, but those are all things that contribute to our, our health and wellness. Yes. And if you want to be healthy and be active and have quality of life, then those are the things, you know, that we have to, we have to take care of ourselves. It's not like, yes. 
I can go to my mechanic and get a new yeah, good oil point. change, an air filter, give me a new tire. You know, we, we're, we're, we got this body. This is what we got. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and uh, well, I've been blessed. You know, I've, I've gone through my own health challenges, but I've been, health has always been an issue for me. I want to, yeah. you know, nobody I've yeah. seen, I saw my buddies blown out their knees in football. I've seen my friends die of, of heart disease, you know, younger yeah. than me or my yeah. age. And I'm like, no, yeah. you know, there has to be. You. And that was that point. And I remember like, as I was at, like, I'm not doing that. I'm not drinking beer every night. And, you know, I, I want something healthy and sustainable. I hear you. One of the things that seems like a major issue these days, I just drove, <clears throat> I flew up to Michigan. I drove somebody down from Michigan to Florida and then I think that was about 1,400 miles. And then I drove from here up to Tennessee and then I drove back down. So I think in total like 3,000 miles in the last uh, two weeks. And I saw a lot of billboards in the middle of the country. Um, and I love America. Like I'm yeah. so proud. I love, I love this country. I'm very proud to live here. And I met so many great people. I feel like there's a lot of harmony on the road. I did see a lot of billboards that said one pill can kill. And it really gave me that feeling of how much the fentanyl issue is right oh now. Boy, yeah. And then when I was uh, get when I was in near Nashville, I overheard them say that right now the city Baltimore has the most fentanyl deaths per day. The second most is Nashville. And I just thought that was so interesting when I was driving through there because I saw all these billboards saying one pill can kill, and you know. You, we really have to pay attention here with purchasing illegal street drugs and obviously getting hooked on oxy and then thinking, well, now I can't have it. How am I going to get it? And then you go for the street and you don't know you're going to have fentanyl and boom, I, that just seems like a big one now. I know there's a million different things we could look at that, that are in relation to how we could pass away, what could take us out. But I think like what you were saying in terms of like, you know, trying to cultivate our health, I think it's, um, it's amazing what's going on these days. I, I keep thinking, like, try to minimize the amount of different <laughs> substances that come in. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. just take it down a notch. Like, minimize. I'm not saying I'm going well, for those substances, but yeah. just even on the level of if I look at my coffee intake or I look at my whatever, well, rice know, intake or whatever, the, you know. What were the founders of Jiva Mukti Yoga? Um, David, yeah. David Life and Sharon Gannon. Right. Okay, yeah. right. So they were heroin addicts before they became yoga addicts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these fentanyl is just a symptom of the, the root, right? And, and whether it's fentanyl, alcohol, food, sex, they're, they're, they're things outside of us that were our coping mechanisms for the emotional pain, you know, turmoil, trauma. Yeah. So these are band-aids. Yeah. You know, it's a, the fentanyl goes back to the, the probably the, Biggest issue facing this country is mental illness, mental disease, which is emotional. You know, if you, if you feel anxious, there's a pill. If you feel depressed, there's a pill. There's a pill for everything. It's easy to go to the pharmacist and get a pill than it is to change your diet and start exercising. And so the, that's the... And so this is going to a segue Great for point. my the, the Chi Ne Tsang, which is the abdominal organ massage therapy. Mm. So in those five organs, there's different emotions associated with those organs. So the liver is anger, right? So you get an angry drunk. Yes. The heart is a love, passion, joy, or, or the lack of, you know, self, lack of self-love, lack of self-worth. Uh, the spleen is worry, overthinking, anxiety, eating disorders. The lungs is mm. grief, uh, smoking. Mm. The kidneys is fear, shock, PTSD, sex issues, you know, how, pornography. Mm. So now these are the band-aids for these emotional wow, that's, issues. That's interesting. Right? Yeah. You know, and uh, your sister, your sister is a colon hydrotherapist. She is. Right? Yes. You know, so Hippocrates said all disease starts in the colon. And in Chinese medicine... The, the sole responsibility of the, col of the large intestine or colon is letting go. And it's whether it's letting go of undigested foods or undigested emotions, mm. right? You know, yep. so, so we're so busy. I don't have time to grieve. My mom died. I got to get to work. I got to raise kids. Yeah. You know, um, and you, you, 
you know, there's as, as many people, there are stories. Um, and so in my role as teacher, doctor is education. And so, yeah, you know, having a drink, having a glass of wine, having a beer with your buddies, that's all great. But again, it's not too much, you know. Mm-hmm. And then what are the other resources that you have? Uh, yoga, uh, paddle boarding, yes. meditation, yes. prayer. Um, so meditation is actually the highest form of medicine in the, in the pillars of Chinese medicine. Interesting. Yeah, right. You know, uh-huh. acupuncture is actually the lowest form because it's invasive. Isn't that interesting then that you see in the yoga world that the asanas where all this emphasis is on, but then meditation is also the pinnacle in the yoga world. At least it depends on who you talk to. But isn't it, it seems interesting that then in the Chinese medicine world, everybody's like, I just want to go for an acupuncture session. But if you were to say, well, let's just go ahead and meditate because it might even do something better that they'd be like, no, I'd rather take the lesser effective approach i'm not saying that the asana or the acupuncture right. is yeah. lesser but it does seem like the entry point it's an entry for point. us to yeah. then start to move up yeah. into this this finer element well i work with the chakras too so i work with the five elements and the five organs in chinese medicine you can affect those a lot through um diet and uh, but with the chakras which are aligned with the endocrine system yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you, and it's funny the way I explained uh, like my sex edge discussion with my kids, I spoke about the chakras. You know, I said, the, so the lower chakra, the root chakra, is uh, safety and security. Do you have a home? Are you homeless? Do you feel safe in your home? You know, uh, the second chakra, you know, called I, I call it the, the, like the umbilical chakra, the belly button chakra. That's your, um, sex and food. So how do you nourish yourself? Are you eating healthy, organic food? Mm-hmm. Or are you doing processed food? Yeah. Are you watching pornography? Or are you in a sacred relationship, you know, with mm-hmm. your beloved? Mm-hmm. The solar plexus is, uh, you know, the sun. How you shine your light out into your world. How do you show up? What's your profession? Or do you wake up in the morning and hate going to work? Or you, you wake up and you're, you're like, you're passionate, yes. you love what you do. Yeah, good point. You know, the, the heart is the bridge. And uh, between the three lower and the three upper, you know, loving yourself and having self-worth. And then the throat is, um, you know, do you bless people with your words or do you curse people with your words? Prince taught me about cursing. He was the one like taught me about the energetic frequency. I love Prince. Of curse words, he doesn't mm. curse. Uh huh. None of his, you know. Uh-huh. And so, I, I, you know, that's a one for my kids because they're yeah. arguing with each other all the yeah. times. And yeah. And then you know the, the 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 pineal gland is your into sense of uh, intuition and intention and, or positive thinking or negative thinking, and the crown chakra, you know, or con- your connection to God. Yes. So it's a it's Jacob's ladder. You have to you can't skip one. You got to start right on the ground. Uh, yeah. Right? You know? Yeah. Yes. Your 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 yes. your cat cow pose. You yes. know your your yeah. down dog. Your up dog. Yes. And then you, you know, as you progress, you know, you you ascend. You know, that's yeah. the ascension yeah. process from yeah. material yeah. to spiritual. Yeah. I mean, yoga. Right, is the, just to prepare the body to sit and meditate in a comfortable position. It's not to put mm. your leg mm. behind your head, mm. your, yeah, your leg behind mm. your head and contort yourself. It's to be able to find a position and learn how to be comf- use your breath and be comfortable in it. So great point. You know, I have a challenge. How do I have amazing conversations with individuals <laughs> <laughs> and try to keep it within a time frame of one hour? Uh oh. How, how long have we been going? We're we're here. We're, All right. we're at the hour of four minute mark. I and so about on myself too much. No, no, you didn't actually. I feel like podcasts or or interviews are it's almost like creating a a, a painting and hearing your story is it's how I learn and how I 
relate my own experience of my development and all the different things that, you know, where I was sought learning and sought training. So I love hearing your story, Keith. So I don't think you talked about yourself too much, to be honest. I think there's a lot to be learned from hearing that process of a having a dream and a vision and like following through, even though like there's some roadblocks opening a business in New York, putting some getting in a tough spot and then not giving up coming to Florida or going to Michigan and helping your parents, a very noble deed. Amazing. Best year of my life. Amazing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Spend some time with them. And then here, 10 years, celebrating 10 year anniversary at your business. I would like to invite you to come back so I could continue asking you more questions. And so we'll just make it a one part and a two part. Awesome. And we'll go a little further into some of the philosophy behind your work and, and how you work in your, in your studio and your business. I always usually like to ask like uh, parting final words. You've already given us plenty to digest and chew on, think about, relate to. Um, well, like, I think like yoga, please. you have asana, you have pranayama and you have meditation. And so my philosophy is healthy body, peaceful mind, joyful heart. That's our, that's our motto at Agape Healing Arts. And I, I did mention it before, which is uh, one of my greatest tools I, I try to share with all my, as many clients as I can and, and friends and people who resonate with the Ho'oponopono, uh, which is that Hawaiian prayer. It, it's non-denominational. And it's just so powerful, words of love and gratitude and forgiveness. Forgiveness is very important in the healing process. And uh, I, I, I encourage everybody, matter of fact, if, if you're watching this, you know, look in the mirror, look at yourself in the mirror and say, I love you. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Thank you. And repeat it enough so that you feel it in your heart. Mm. And if you have issues with anybody if you have challenges with your relationship i make my kids say this to each other when it gets heated um it, it is really the most healing um those words were, what was that for it was four sentences wasn't it yeah i love you please forgive me i'm sorry thank you and those were the words uh dr omoto uh would use um, when working with the water, that was the prayer that um, that he really brought out uh, to the public. And um, I say it under my breath all the time. If I get upset at somebody tailgating me on the highway, or if my wife triggers me, or if my kids make me upset, or if my clients are, are having challenges in their own life, I'm like, take this home. Say it to your partner. Say it to whoever you need to say it to. And you'll say it like a rosary, you know, over and over again. And it starts to change and shifts and go from one person to the other person. But, it, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in the power of prayer. My wife is one of the strongest prayer warriors I know. We, we recite a lot of different prayers, but that's the... That's the staple. I put that on my grave, I think. All right. I, <laughs> I love uh, it. It's, it's a real good one, and it's one I love to, to share and encourage people to practice on their own. I love you. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs>